After a tumultuous 2020, the issues of racial justice and equality still remain. We sit down with Betty Andrews of Iowa, Nebraska, NAACP, and Justin Lewis of the nonprofit group Des Moines Selma on this edition of Iowa Press. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa PBS Foundation. The Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Fuel Iowa is a voice and a resource for Iowa's fuel industry. Our members offer a diverse range of products, including fuel, grocery, and convenience items. They help keep Iowans on the move in rural and urban communities. Together, we fuel Iowa. Small businesses are the backbone of Iowa's communities, and they are backed by Iowa banks. With advice, loans, and financial services, banks across Iowa are committed to showing small businesses the way to a stronger tomorrow. Learn more at iowabankers.com. For decades, Iowa Press has brought you politicians and newsmakers from across Iowa and beyond celebrating nearly 50 years of broadcast excellence on statewide Iowa PBS. This is the Friday, August 13 edition of Iowa Press. Here is David Yepsen. After the tumultuous events of 2020 provided a spotlight for racial justice and equality issues in America, many of the same concerns remain well into 2021. To explore the Iowa impact and challenges, we're joined by Betty Andrews, president of the Iowa-Nebraska NAACP, and Justin Lewis, a community activist and founder of Des Moines Selma, a nonprofit aimed at educating Iowans about the black experience. Welcome to you both. Thanks for taking time to be with us. Thanks so much for having me. And I want our viewers to know that to accommodate schedules, we're taping this on August the 6th. Also joining us across the table, Kay Henderson is news director at Radio Iowa, and Aaron Murphy, is Des Moines Bureau Chief for Lee Enterprises. Betty Andrews, in August of last year, Governor Reynolds signed an executive order extending felon voting rights. Um, Iowa Public Radio's Katerina Sestark did a story recently which found of the roughly 35 to 45,000 people who might be eligible mm -hmm. to register to vote, only 5,000 have done so. Why? It's a really good question why and, and we believe, the NAACP believes that part of the issue is that people still have hesitation when dealing with um, government and systems and you can imagine someone who is formerly incarcerated now having to um, turn to government and to do anything and so um, we believe very strongly that there's that hesitancy but also and I think that this is a huge part of it, um, w there has not been enough strong promotion of, of the um, the um, executive order and one of the things that we recently in a meeting with the governor asked her to do is to use her bully pulpit to make sure that people are aware that this is um, uh, something that they can do in terms of um, the formerly incarcerated and so we are really pushing um, and, and we've also started a campaign to do that along with a number of other organizations and we've been working throughout the year to do that as well. Justin, what's your answer to Kay's question? Why uh, so long? Can you re re answer So the uh, question? among the um, folks who might be eligible to register up to 45,000, only mm -hmm. 5,000 have taken that option of registering to vote. Yeah, um, I would guess my question, my answer would be what are the barriers that are holding them back? Um, a lot of people we got to be mindful are fighting just to survive um, and going to get a, an ID and sitting in the DMV takes time from their family and their jobs. Um, so I think that may be a, a barrier, uh, but I'm not too in touch and in tapped with that just yet. Um, so yeah. Betty Andrews, the felon voting executive order was issued by the governor that can be undone by the next governor as, as has been the case with recent administrations. A more permanent solution has proved elusive thus far in amending the state's constitution. What is your hope for the future of that proposal? Is, it, is that still a possibility that we get a proposed constitutional amendment or do you fear with the current makeup of the Iowa legislature that that's 
not going to get to the Iowa voters. I think you're hitting it right on the head with the question in terms of we are hopeful that a constitutional amendment could happen. Um, we would love to see um, the, the tenets of executive order number seven um, permanently, permanently in place. However, under the current legislature, we are a little bit hesitant because we are not certain that they would be interested in passing such um, uh, a, a, an amendment that would be be as strong as the executive order. So um, we are we are kind of playing it by ear and just kind of watching to see what that next move might be. And, and Justin Lewis, to you, the, the other thing that the legislature did in prepare, preparation for a possible constitutional amendment is added a requirement that if this becomes a constitutional amendment that there's some additional requirements for someone who completes their sentence. For example, they would have to pay court fines or things like that which some advocates have expressed concerns about. I wonder if you have any thoughts on yeah, that and if that do. <laughs> undoes the good that, that, that yeah. making these people um, so eligible I'm, did in the first place. I believe once you're released, you've served your time and you've, you've paid your debt to society. Um, so uh, effectively making those folks pay off those, those debts uh, is still really incarcerating them outside of uh, the penitentiary and, and jail cells. So um, I think it's important that <clears throat> once they are released, they should be able to become citizens again, and we should treat them like citizens, and this is, a, this is truly a barrier. And speaking of citizens, if I may, yep. the other thing that um, advocacy organizations, and in particular the NAACP, have done is worked with the Secretary of State's office mm -hmm. to make sure that this process is welcoming. So in order to register, we um, offered um, uh, language for their website and for their video to ensure that people understand and are welcome um, into this process. We also called for the um, meeting of the register the voter registration form successfully. Um, that commission met and did make some changes in order to update the language that to, to show that people with a felony background can vote. If somebody watching has a, maybe has a felony background and would like to vote, what should they do? Well, one of the things they can do is contact the NAACP, um, but also they can simply uh, contact the Secretary of State's office. The information is there online, and, and um, we hope that it's much easier, easier um, to access just because of the work that we've done. And so um, we would encourage them to do that. Also, any organization that they may have been working with, um, that would be helpful. The other thing that we are doing is working with the governor to um, work with the Department of Corrections so that there is outreach from the Department of Corrections to those who are um, have been released from custody or um, um, off paper uh, that um, they can notify those individuals as well. So there is a number of avenues that we are looking at in terms of pushing um, to ensure that we get those other uh, 40 plus thousand people registered. All right, what, what if they don't have access to a computer? Sure. Can they go to the county auditor's office can, in their county and have their problem solved? They can. They can go to the county auditors. They can um, certainly call any of the official agencies. They can call um, the, really, any official, any public official should be able to direct them to um, the registration uh, process. Before we go any farther with the, our interview, I just want to give each of you a chance to explain a little bit about what your organizations do. A lot of people may be familiar with, have heard of the NAACP, but what is it you're doing sure. here? Sure, so the NAACP, we are about 112 um, years old now, so we're the nation's oldest and um, largest and um, with the most longevity in terms of civil rights um, and social justice. And so we've been around for um, quite a bit of time. And in, in Iowa, we have about 30 units of the organization, and um, those fall in my jurisdiction. So um, we are on the ground in many communities across Iowa. And Justin, what is Des Moines Selma? Yeah, so Des Moines Selma was birthed out of the movement of Black Lives Matter last summer. Uh, and what, as the leader of it, what I realized was <clears throat> it was the education and the lack of understanding of our community that was holding some barriers, uh, holding things back. Uh, and since then, we've been in a lot of nonprofit and for-profit organizations teaching about the black experience, but teaching about implicit bias and then also pushing in, uh, the culture and uh, pushing the culture of the company forward as well. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what we've been doing and that's, that's what we've been focusing on. 
Justin, um, there have been some recent acquittals of people who were arrested during protests in the Des Moines area last year, and there has been some criticism of the Des Moines Police Department and how it handled uh, the protests. What's your view? Yeah, um, so I'm, I'm all for free speech. I'm all for folks being out to uh, get into the streets and air out their grievances. That, that's our American right. Um, and that's what was given to us at the creation of this country. So I think <clears throat> when those are being jeopardized by law enforcement, uh, rightfully so, charges should be dropped, the cases should <clears throat> be removed. Um, I think <clears throat> that was the main issue on a lot of acquittals being um, handed out here recently. Betty Andrews, what's your view? Well, I think in general, we need to look at um, freedom of speech um, in our state. Here at the, here in this last legislative session, mm -hmm. we got um, really harsh laws um, aimed at kind of the backlash for protesters. And we should really be focusing on making sure that people are able to um, speak because that actually makes our government stronger. Mm -hmm. And so seeing um, people rightfully and lawfully protesting um, shouldn't be an issue. And so in terms of acquittals, obviously we want people to be safe and, and the law to be upheld, but we do also want to make sure that people are, um, are, ha are exercising or allowed to exercise their um, constitutional rights. And that was exactly what I wanted to ask you about next, that the, we saw legislation passed and, and the governor um, at the start of the session proposed a, a combined package of some support for law enforcement and some some social justice racial equity issues only one side of that ledger got moved I'll, I'll ask you both about this but I bet I'll start with you uh, how disappointed were you in that and and how much of that do you think was backlash over the protests or were some legislators do you feel reacting to the defund the police movement? What are your thoughts on sure. that? Sure. So the NAACP has deemed this last session the most anti-black session in recent history. So this is, um, you know, even if we started with the um, anti-racial profiling or unbiased policing um, uh, bill paired with the back the blue. Um, it was hugely upsetting for us to see those two pieces of legislation even combined because they really serve two completely different purposes. And also, have, after having met and worked with the governor's focus committee on criminal justice for over a year with the goal of an anti, um, an, an unbiased policing bill, it was really, um, it, was, it was a hard hit. Um, it was like a poison pill. And so um, just, uh, you know, thinking about that, and then we got even, um, um, you know, the qualified immunity for uh, the police. And uh, there was already qualified immunity on the table, so now um, police officers um, don't have uh, have even less personal responsibility um, to act. And and what we want to say, and and certainly I understand the 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 cries for defund the police, and I also understand what the concerns are around the, those cries. However, the goal it was certainly not to empower p police to be able to um, to step. Um, even further down um, a, a, a path that is dangerous for people. Justin, and, and maybe I'll, I'll ask you, because it seems like when you s talk about defund the police, it means you ask three different people what that means and you may get three different answers. Mm -hmm. yeah. When you hear or say that term, is that to you, is that a literal term? Is that a figurative term? What, what does defund the police mean oh, to you? Oh, well, I, I, like, like you said, it's, it's multiple things. Um, but from my perspective, it's always been about government accountability and transparency. Government be bending to the will of people, listening to the concerns of its residents and citizens, um, and, and doing right by them. Um, so <clears throat> even this summer when I led one of the largest marches this uh, in Iowa with over 5,000 people, it wasn't about defunding the police for me. It was about holding them accountable for their actions. Um, even if you're facilitating the law, you're not above the law. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, I'm a culture builder and I go into these spaces, so it's, you know, setting the standard high. If you act out and you, you break the trust of communities and of citizens and residents, you have to be removed Justin, so that culture can start going forward. Isn't it time, though, for uh, black leaders like, you, like you, each of you um, 
disavow this defund the police rhetoric. It's a political loser. It's, it's backfired politically. Republicans are jumping up and down at what uh, Congresswoman Bush from uh, St. Louis uh, is doing, sleeping on the steps of the Capitol, saying defund the police. It's just... Yeah, my... Why don't you just disavow it and move on? <laughs> yeah, as so at the trainer in me, um, what I would call folks to do here in Iowa is to lean in and listen. Why are people so frustrated that they would want to defund the um, law enforcement? What is going on? What is the true concern? What is at the core of those cries for justice, that core of uh, alleviating a service that protects a lot of us here in Iowa? Um, so what I would call folks to do that are watching and listening now is to, to lean in, lean into your black friend, lean into your black cousin, lean into your, your black um, your coworker and start asking questions about what's going on in your community. What have you seen? Uh, because we've all experienced something in the black community that um, some of our white counterparts won't understand or won't see, but we need you to listen and understand. Betty Andrews, what's it your It certainly answer? provokes the conversation yeah. in terms of, yeah. um, you know, the terms defund the police. And I, and as Justin mentioned earlier, it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So for mm -hmm. um, people who have kind of a very narrow view of what it means, they may want to um, have people denounce it. But when you think about how it's really a call for accountability and asking people to take take a look and and also divest some of the funds that are used in policing into mental health and other strategies. Um, it is, um, that's where, um, that's where a lot of leaders stand. Then why not say it that way? Why, defund the police means, mm -hmm. look up the meaning, to take money away from. You know, I you just that are people, not talking about that. You're talking I, I, about a lot of other things. Right. I think that people have been saying it that way. They have been saying it that way for some time. And, they, and with the conversation and using the terminology defund the police, kind of like critical race theory, mm -hmm. um, it certainly does um, uh, uh, engage people and um, to have that conversation and right. and when you start talking about the extreme it does open um, it, in some ways the opportunity to talk about um, some of the other things that can be done um, between here and there and we want to talk about other things mm -hmm. okay um, yep. let's talk about racial profiling mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. a bill on racial profiling has emerged through the Iowa Senate before the governor proposed it as part of a larger package this year as you mentioned, Betty Andrews, it was part of a negotiated um, sort of task force oriented package that was presented to legislators. Why, in your view, is it not gaining traction and becoming law? You know, it's interesting. Um, certainly, uh, quite frankly, I believe that some of the backlash from this past year. So we can talk about that there have been gains from the protests, but clearly we have seen a number of legislative um, dives to, to counter that. And if you ask me, I think it's racism. That's the reason why um, it was not supported and it did not pass. Um, in terms of the um, some of the things that that uh, piece of legislation proposed, it it was um, data collection. That data collection is extremely important in terms of making, um, putting an eye to make sure that we are doing what we're supposed to be doing when it comes to our citizens. To, um, that you know that that kind of like what Dr. King said, that check that needs to be cashed um, that African Americans and other people of, of um, other races need to cash that check. So that data collection piece and a number of the other things, they are not bad and many of them were supported by like the Iowa Chiefs Association and a number of other things. So um, it, I, I feel that in, it was part, partly due to this climate um, you know, just the, the backlash. I mean, we're seeing um, laws from um, uh, that were written or executive orders from President Trump that are kind of transposed now into state law, et cetera, et cetera. Wanted to ask you each about a couple of issues that arose also from this legislative session that you referenced, Betty, one that did pass and one that didn't. Um, Justin, I'll start with you. Um, the, the legislature did act on schools that had diversity, so-called diversity plans. Uh, they banned schools from having those which they were put in place to allow schools to reject some open enrollment in, in order to maintain a more diverse student population. We've already seen that having an impact. Um, uh, my group of papers reported Waterloo, Des Moines, some of the uh, Davenport, some of the districts with the highest percentage of black students in the state have, have seen 
um, white students leaving the districts. What's your level of concern with those? And, and that's, this is kind of exactly what advocates who were opposed to that proposal warned about, right? And, and what's your level of concern for the, the future yeah. of those, those minority students in those districts? Yeah, it honestly reminds me of not too long ago about of segregation. Um, when private schools would start popping up in the South, and and if you're familiar with the term white white flight, where folks were just leaving the inner cities and, and going to the suburban areas, that legislation allowed that to take place, and it's going to continue to take place. Um, I think the biggest thing that we need more than anything is we need our our white counterparts and our family members to really start doing the work of what is, or what are, who are we voting for, and what are they representing, and what are they going to do. Because uh, this is a clear action of racism. It's a clear action of a lack of connection to folks in the black community, Hispanic community, uh, people of color communities. Um, it, it's, it's, getting, it's getting scary for us, for sure. Just a few and, minutes left. And, and Betty, you mentioned critical race theory. That, there wasn't a critical race theory specific bill that passed the other legislature. They did one that banned so-called divisive topics. But, but more broadly, that, the 1619 Project, the, these things that... Uh, people are trying to use to uh, teach about the history of this country mm -hmm. and, and, and racism's, uh, you know, role in, in, in that early time. Just wanted to get your thoughts on yeah. how useful they are and, and your thoughts on these well, bills, these efforts to stop the use of those in schools. You know, we had a lot of um, challenges on Capitol Hill this year when it came to education. And certainly, as um, Justin mentioned, and I just want to acknowledge as a um, representative of the, of the organization that successfully argued Brown versus the Board of um, Education, we were um, uh, really daunted in terms of the um, the support for in in a roundabout way way se resegregating schools, and I think that that's what's been happening in Iowa. And in terms of the um, the bill that was passed, that was really close to critical race theory. Um, we certainly, I, I think, the bigger concern about that bill is the chilling effect that it has and the message that it sends. And quite frankly, um, the concern in, in terms of generally what happened on the le in the legislature this year is about the spirit that was behind it. And we feel very strongly that that spirit had a lot of racial implications. Okay. Um, Aaron and I get paid to listen to the legislature debate. And during the back the blue debate, which enhanced penalties for protest related yeah crimes, um, Republican legislators argued that protesters were not respectful of small business property. Um, there was damage to small business property um, and damage to government property in some instances. And so that was why they needed to pass these enhanced um, regulations or penalties. W what do you say to those who say um, those things were needed because of what they saw during the protests? Fear-mongering, looking for a boogeyman, looking for an issue that isn't there. Uh, like I said, I led one of the largest marches and there was no property damage. Everyone was very well-mannered. Uh, we had business owners giving out water and free merchandise and Black Lives Matter signs and support Black Lives Matter. Um, and a bunch of orgs seen uh, large increases in our donations and so forth. Uh, so <clears throat> I, I, what I will say to some of those re Republican legislators who I know are not from Des Moines, who I know who are not connected to a lot of these inner city uh, organizations and nonprofits come down here and have some conversations with us. Um, yeah. Betty, um, one of the things the NAACP has been arguing for is criminal sentencing reform. What are the prospects for that in the current environment? Well, you know, we continue to press, when we, but we also recognize that we're up against a legislature that has ideas of their own, and we are, you know, we we've made some um, some progress um, in years past when it came to um, crack cocaine versus um, powder co cocaine mm -hmm. sentencing. So we are always pressing and pushing, and we're also working with the Supreme Court um, to work on some of their laws, not only for sentencing but also the 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 uh, the bail system in terms of how that that is scheduled and and how the you know what crime constitutes so much bail. So a number of other. Justin, we've got just about a minute left. What's your view of the state of race relations in Iowa today? I'm hopeful. Um, I'm hopeful because of the organizations we've have went into and had these discussions and they're going to continue to bring us back. And then they are pushing our message out to the other orgs. 
Um, what, what I truly want to see is that we bring up these conversations, these divisive conversations, but talk about bias and where they come from and how they grow into prejudice and racism and hate. Ben that Anders, will be to make the difference. Less than a minute. <laughs> State of race relations in I, I think hopeful is a good word. That's why we do this work. However, mm -hmm. we're also realistic and know yes. that it's going to take a lot of work. Yes. And so our plan is to keep on pushing and um, educating and uh, building relationships and making sure that we are focused on um, protesting is important, but also policy yes. and moving to policy. And that's the work that the NAACP continues to do. And representative leadership as well. We need folks that look like us in power. Absolutely. And I need to watch the clock. We're out of time. <laughs> thank, thank you both for being with us Thank today. you so thank much you. for having us. Thanks for having us. And we'll be back next week with another edition of Iowa Press as we explore the issues confronting Iowa's private colleges. We'll be joined by Grinnell College President Ann Harris and Wartburg College President Daryl Colson. That's Iowa Press next week at our regular times, 7.30 Friday night and noon on Sunday. So for all of us here at Iowa PBS, I'm David Yepsen, and thanks for joining us today. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa PBS Foundation, the Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Fuel Iowa is a voice and a resource for Iowa's fuel industry. Our members offer a diverse range of products, including fuel, grocery, and convenience items. They help keep Iowans on the move in rural and urban communities. Together, we fuel Iowa. Small businesses are the backbone of Iowa's communities, and they are backed by Iowa banks. With advice, loans, and financial services, banks across Iowa are committed to showing small businesses the way to a stronger tomorrow. Learn more at iowabankers.com.